Hello, welcome to another episode of Outer Sounds. I'm here today with Michael Harrison, John also Bennett, and Christina Vansu. And uh, we'll be chatting about their new self-titled album on Seance Center, which is the October selection for Outer Sounds. How are you all doing today? Pretty good. Good. We're Thanks for being here. Um, yeah. where, where are you all uh, located or talking from today? Um, me and Christina are in Brussels, Belgium. Okay. Uh, here at our apartment in Saint Gilles. Nice. And I'm in the middle of a residency at the Boliasco Foundation near Genoa, Italy. Nice, nice. Um, so the this new record is is so beautiful. Um, I I can't stop listening to it. It's like that kind of record. Um, I'm really really digging it and. Um, just maybe a good way to start is just curious of how the three of you sort of met and linked up and decided to to work together and make a record together. You want to start? Well, I'm curious. I hear Michael's side of the story. <laughs> Michael can start. So it was uh, in April. I remember it was the the night of Greek Orthodox Easter in 2018 and uh, Christina Jensen who's a fabulous cellist that we all work with was premiering a work of mine uh, for the ambient Claire, Claire, Claire. 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 oh yeah I work with both Clarice and yeah. Christina yeah. and uh, so I went way out to uh, what, it was like what, a Bushwick Bushwick, Bushwick. right Bushwick in Brooklyn and was just completely amazed by this gathering, you know, because the Amiot church has like, I don't know, like 500 people coming and this huge church was just completely packed with a millennial audience, which for me as a, you know, more of a contemporary Western classical composer, you know, like it's a dream to have an audience like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, I was really, really just kind of blown away by the whole scene. And, um, and Christina was the headliner. So she was doing, you know, her show right after Claris. So I was just really moved by the whole experience. And then uh, Christina reached out to me uh, shortly afterwards and um, wanted to get together and, you know, talk about music and, and things. So I did, and we found that we really had a kind of simpatico because I, I had been listening to Christina's music and was really fascinated by how she works with musicians that improvise and then, you know, kind of creates an atmosphere for them to do a certain type of music that they might not ordinarily even do. Right. And through her processes in the studio, she creates these, you know, really rich, gorgeous sound works. Yeah. So, uh, and for me, and those, I, although I'm an improviser and I've spent, you know, I improvise every day and spend a lot of time improvising music, almost all of my published work is either notated or, you know, fixed composition. Right. And so this felt like a really great opportunity. I was just curious about her project process and I kind of was desiring to be one of those musicians in the studio. <laughs> Or improvising and seeing, you know, how the whole process worked. Yeah. And so um, it ended up that she felt the same way, like, you know, that, that maybe we could really come up with something working together. And so shortly after this, we, we met once, just the two of us, and then she suggested that we also work with John, because, you know, obviously she has this amazing relationship with John and, and they did a lot of things together. So we had another meeting with John and that felt really right. Uh, so then we planned to do this residency. So we met like in December of 2019, 2018. And then we planned this residency in Brussels at the, how do you pronounce it, Christina? Abbe Salon, the Abbe Salon. Abbe Salon. And they were just really supportive because they gave us this amazing space with a beautiful piano for three days. Nice. So we 
um, we developed the whole project there. You know, we basically came up with the concepts for the pieces and, um, and figured out kind of how we would work together. And so then the next stage was that we, and we recorded a lot. I mean, we recorded a ton of material, one of which, one track, Open Delay 2, made it onto the album. Oh, okay. <clears throat> and then we, we booked a week with Francesco, Francesco Donatello at his studio in Berlin in December of 2019 and just recorded hours of music. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, a lot of things that we didn't do in Brussels, but we kind of set up our procedures for working together in Brussels. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't over because we kept working on the music, especially John. You know, John like really kind of dove in deep during the right. deep COVID times when there wasn't a lot happening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Edited, remixed, and, and tracks that we thought we're going to use didn't make it on the album and other tracks did. And, and um, things like Sirens, you know, which originally had a piano track, the piano disappeared. You just hear the piano being processed. Mm -hmm. So it, it really, it really took some, some big changes. Um, and I just want to take this opportunity to say for me, it was really an amazing experience because um, it kind of gave me, Christina and John gave me the support to go into the studio and just do everything without anything pre-planned. Yeah. You know, and, and then it came out so beautifully. So it's okay. really changed my view on what I can do as an artist and what I'm hoping to do as I proceed, you know, through my life in music. Yeah. Um, yeah, John, Christina, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, just the, um, when I reached out to Michael, we had just come from some traveling. So we, I, I knew about Michael because like you said, Clarice and I performed together and Michael had actually written one of the pieces for Clarice's record that came out. And I, I love that record and I love that piece. So I, I was vaguely aware of Michael Harrison and, but really didn't know his music or his, you know, uh, discography or biography as such. But um, yeah, we had, we were traveling and we had this really nice uh, Joshua tree visit where John and I stayed maybe three nights and we'd go into the park. We were staying really close by. And um, it's always really inspirational there. So quiet. And this voice came inside my head and said, email Michael Harrison. I thought, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but literally that's what happened. I, that's why I wrote Michael Harrison that email and we had that first meeting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah <laughs> and i mean i came into the project i think christina uh, had at least one maybe two meetings with michael because i i i've lived in new york for about 12 years until right. like march this okay. march um so at that point i was still living in new york and me and christina are married we weren't married yet at that point, but, and she was, so she, Christina will come to New York for a, a month or two and vice versa. I would come to Brussels, but at that point she was in New York and she said, you know, she was like, I'm going up to Yonkers to meet this, uh, Michael Harrison. Um, and I, I of course knew who Michael was through his previous work and, you know, I, uh, the piece that he wrote for Clarice. Um, so I was like, that's great. I was really excited for her to go meet him. They they kind of set up this idea to do this residency in Brussels. Um, and uh, Christina was just like very... Uh, well, she, it was pretty, things get clear in my mind really She knew early. that I should be involved. Well, I, you know, in this initial meeting in Yonkers, we talked about tuning and Michael has... Uh, pianos in his home um, and you know we didn't sit and play but maybe just a few 
notes just to show me, look, this is tuned this way. And, right. and then wrote, he very kindly wrote some math on paper and some, <laughs> some uh, interval, intro, you know, uh, sketches for me. And, and then, um, yeah, I learned also quickly about the experience Michael had with Raga and his daily life and his meditation practice and how it went. It had been going on for years and years and years and years. And that just seems like such a beautiful area to step into. And then, yeah. and then that also immediately brings to mind John, because, you know, if, if we want, uh, I just, you know, sometimes that's how it works in my mind, just to, you know, imagining ahead a scenario of uh, kind of a palette and the modular synth uh, tones felt spot on. So, of course, he's my partner. I'm happy to recommend him, but, yeah. you know, really, he's the right person for that. So, yeah, I mean, and, and then, you know, they, we had this residency set up in Brussels. And we didn't really know what we were going to do ahead of time. And it just, it just clicked pretty fast that I could, I could do these drones on the modular along with Michael's piano, which by the way, we, we tried, we did two different tunings during that residency. Also there's two tunings on the record. Um, so it, and it was just like yeah okay so we're gonna tune the modular to the to the piano and I can do these drones on the modular and Michael can play and Christina was just sort of guiding guiding the vibes you know and making suggestions play a little bit like this play a little bit more like that and just like uh you know providing all these great ideas and direction yeah and an image sometimes you know just all, all the, the goodies that work well yeah. and M michael yeah. reacted immediately to the tone you know as a as a support and also said many times like wow i'm you know i have space i don't have to fill in all the space or it gives right. me space i can yeah. um yeah so it, it just organically became the trio in that residency, I would say. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, Michael, you mentioned the, you know, this was, this gave you a, a opportunity to improvise um, in a, you know, on a recording and in this, you know, project. I know that you, you know, you studied with Pandi Pranath, right? And studied Indian classical music, Drew Pod style. Um, you know, that obviously involves a lot of improvisation working with you know different ragas and modes um so i'm guessing that you know that it probably is very natural for you to improvise you know and just you just hadn't done it like kind of in a public s sphere or recording i suppose well yes it is very natural for me to improvise in fact that's really kind of my basic form of music making I mean, even from the time I was a teenager, I, I've been improvising yeah. regularly. Um, and not just with Indian music, but other things, but it is the essence of Indian music. Right. And I, over the last, you know, I've been studying Indian classical music and performing and teaching it for almost 45 years. So a long time. Mm -hmm. And the last 10 plus years, I've been adapting it for the piano. So I've been playing okay. Vagas on the piano. Yeah. But I hadn't released any of that material and I hadn't recorded it. So it was kind of all just germinating in me, waiting to come out. And so this yeah. this was kind of the first place that I had, you know, felt like the right opportunity to, to explore that in a recorded format. Right. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, one of the first things that caught me on the record is it, I think there are three ragas on there. Um, we've got Bageshri, Yaman, and Talang um, on there. And I was like, oh, cool. We got some, we got some raga. Were you working, you know, strictly with those, um, you know, the raga scales and melodies, you know, for those pieces? Yes, absolutely. So all three of those raga based pieces, 
pretty strictly with the raga, so there aren't any nodes outside the raga. But there are some innovative elements. So, for example, if we take Harp of Yemen, uh, Yemen is a really interesting scale because the ascending scale is the minor pentatonic starting on the seventh degree of the scale. Mm -hmm. So when it, when it first comes in on that piece, there's no drone, and you hear what sounds like a C sharp minor pentatonic. Mm -hmm. And then about a minute later, this drone comes in a half step higher on D. <laughs> right? Yeah. And it just so sets the foundation. Yeah. A bitonal shift that happens. That, and that's what I really love about the way we did that piece. And you don't, I mean, you kind of, that's part of the structure of the raga. So you kind of hear that anyway and explore that anyway, but not in such a clear way as we did on this recording. Right. Because in a, in a traditional performance, you would hear the tamburas or whatever right away at the beginning that would set the tonality. Yeah. So that's interesting that that slides in later on the piece. And uh, another thing is the microtonal intervals that we use in Tilong. So Tilong was performed on the revelation, modified revelation tuning. I call it modified because one note the note B natural is changed from my revelation tuning and it becomes a major third instead of a okay. that third. And uh, so we did T long in, in that tuning, which has all these septimal commas, these, you know, very small microtonal intervals between pairs of white and black notes. And so we explored those microtonal relationships in the performance of that raga. And that's something that, you wouldn't really normally hear in a traditional Indian concert. I mean, a really good singer might sing those different microtonal shades of the notes right. that are already kind of latent within the raga, but you wouldn't hear them for certainly on a piano or on a piano where you had both microtonal versions of the same note mm -hmm. tuned shimmer together with a sustain pedal. Right. So that's a kind of a kind of forward looking way to approach raga that the tuning yep. gave us. And then the, that helped lead into other things. You know, John played the piano in open delay and open delay two. Mm -hmm. Both of those are in the modified revelation tuning. Okay. So it's a really different map. I mean, a layout of the keyboard, the black keys, some of the black keys are tuned actually lower in pitch than <laughs> the white keys that are to the right. Yeah. <laughs> and there's a reason for that. It's not just to be weird. <laughs> it's that the black keys set up a series of fifths and the white keys set up a fair series of fifths so that okay. the tuning is kind of color coded. So it's very intuitive. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it, 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 John's approach to it shows how well that it actually works because he was able to very quickly learn the tuning and adapt and improvise those pieces, you know, with a completely different keyboard map. Yeah. Um, so, and that relates to that whole, sonically, it's very similar, open delay one and open delay two, to what we did in Tilong, you know, playing these, these uh, septimal commas, or these simultaneously microtonal intervals. And it worked out really beautifully. I, I think especially for open delay one, that's one of my favorite tracks on the album. Yeah, it's really nice. Um, John, how do you how do you manage to uh, tune like the modular tones to such specific intervals and pitches, you know, to so that it blends with the piano? Was that was that difficult or do you have to like get there with, a you know, whatever oscilloscope or, you know, you just, <laughs> use, you you just, use, your, you just use your ears. Uh, I mean, yeah. like that was something that definitely I uh learned from michael on during this process was i mean i knew how to tune by ear before but just like really really listening right i mean we would sit there and play one note on the piano and and the modular just you know the fine tune like either michael or i i think we kind of went back and forth yeah. sometimes i if i couldn't get it just right we like we would switch and Michael would stand there during yeah. the knob and you just wait until uh, it's you know you hear the beats and you wait until it feels like glass 
you know, and it, it sometimes would take a while to get yeah, it just right. And and also I'm I'm not using just sign tones, you know, I'm using sometimes more complex waveforms. Um, so it's not always super easy to to get them tuned perfectly to the piano. Right. Um, but we would usually do two oscillators at a fourth or a fifth. Um, and I think in one, in T-Long, we had another, we had a seventh, a third oscillator. And my job was just really to listen. I mean, it was during the sessions in Berlin, um, it was me and Michael in the room and Christina in the, in the control room. Um, and it's definitely, yeah, it was like a meditation, you know, because I'm gradually adjusting the, the wave shape in some cases or gradually adjusting the filter cutoff. Um, and that's, and maybe bringing, you know, the volume up and down, but it's just these three basic parameters changing. Mm -hmm. Um, but nothing was like automated. I was doing it all by hand. So it's yeah. just like really slow changes over the course of, uh, the piece. Um, in general, I mean, I think, on, yeah, like on sirens, obviously that was like the free form piece where, uh, Christina wanted the synthesizers to take, take the forefront. And, and so Michael is kind of following me in that case, um, mm -hmm. I think, but in general, it was just trying to really blend into the resonance of the piano as best I can and just right. support that. Yeah. Um, and I, I remember those couple times that Michael jumped in and did the fine tuning at the end. Yeah. Because, you know, his ears are so trained right. to scale. So he said, oh, I think we can just, and then jump on and yeah. he would fine tune. Yeah. I I gonna, that oh, sorry. I was going to ask. Fine tuning. Yeah. Project. <laughs> yeah. Because we did a lot of fine tuning. <laughs> I, I think like the one thing that stuck with me that and Michael correct me if I'm getting this wrong but you, you said something that maybe Lamont said to, said to you at one point which was like you want to get those revolutions so that it's like it's like the rotation of the earth around the sun you know because at some point it's like and you get really close and you want to it's like you might not ever get it perfectly, right. but you can get it. So it's so long that it's, it's like, it's like the earth going around the sun and it's like imperceptible, you know? Yeah, that's really beautiful. That's actually from Lamont Young's program notes to the well-tuned piano. He has a paragraph where he talks about tuning as a function of time and that how astronomers know that the longer they observe planetary motion the more they can tell about its orbit yeah uh, so the same thing applies to tuning you know that you have an orbit of two tones you know interacting together and the, then the more you listen the more you, finally you can tune so the acoustical beats get slower and slower and slower yeah um yeah, John, I wanted to ask another th like follow up on that. So you were you and Michael were performing together live and you were kind of laying a, a bed or foundation, which I love on the album that I feel like the electronics um, and everything are so um, supportive and sympathetic and create this really nice, subtle background to let Michael do his thing. Um, and obviously you're probably reacting to Michael as he's improvising as well. Um, mm -hmm. How much Michael mentioned earlier that you, you know, during lockdown or whatever, you also spent some time, you know, doing some like post-processing or editing and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, did you do any like overdubbing or what was the process like that after you had generated a bunch of material in Berlin in the studio? Yeah, so I mean, we we did this week long session in Berlin. I think it was 
three days of recording and two days of mixing with Francesco in Berlin. Mm -hmm. um, with a day off in the middle. Maybe with a day off in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, so it was pretty, it was pretty compact. And we did get a lot, a lot done. Um, but I think it was just like the pieces needed some time uh, to marinate, you know, um, or to cure. Um, and so we took some time off from listening because it was really a concentrated recording and mixing experience. Um, and that was, yeah, that was December 2019. Uh, and then, you know, March 2020 rolls around and we find ourselves like locked down mm -hmm. for months at a time. Uh, so, yeah, it, it was just, it was a really good space to work on this album. Um, I didn't do any overdub. I, I don't think, I think maybe, maybe there was like one small synthesizer sound that I added. Mm -hmm. like to sirens but uh in general it was editing and uh eq like and cheering uh, yeah sirens. yeah so sirens is kind of an isolated case on the album where i did apply a lot of processing um yeah. so like the, the piano the piano is like is uh just you can hear like this like grain uh spectral sample of the piano so it sort of sounds like a ghost of the piano mm -hmm. um that one yeah we just wanted there to be sort of a break a break from the piano on the album but it's still there really and and like the synthesizer you hear you know it, it was recorded with michael so it, it it still really is both of us on that track mm -hmm. um but for the for the rest of it it was it was like yeah putting these like notch eqs on the piano uh and on the synthesizer to really bring out those long tails resonance tales of resonance um which which were already there but that's one of my favorite things to do uh with mixing is is to just find those uh uh harmonics and and right. And pull, just pull them out and highlight them. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, I mean, beyond that, it was like editing, you know, and getting the album to this place where it is now, which I, I think it was pretty successful. Like, I, I've listened to the album a lot. Oh, I <laughs> and I, I, I'm still not sick of it, you know, in, yeah, in general. It's, like, uh... it's yeah yeah i was gonna i wanted to say to christina as well i think you know uh this record has such a cohesive uh vibe or feeling or mood to it and it sounds like that was kind of what you were directing in the studio and it really um there's something about it that just really the whole thing really like speaks as a piece there's you know it's it's more minimal subtle um it just has a it has a feeling to it i don't know how to describe it but okay. it's there okay. i'm yeah. happy to hear that that feeling feeling is always the first point of contact for me so mm -hmm. and also as i wasn't playing i i was doing that the whole time right and then and then without without any men too much mental you know john and michael had to be busy with technique to a certain extent even if we're not focusing on it you know it's it's always nice like in in my own records i like to take breaks and listen because you you start to um listen after breaks because it's fresh and the feeling is stronger again you know and yeah. so the yeah i think the that's there and i also remember doing a lot of really long listens here in this living room laying on the floor we have these 
gentle X and we just play what we had and then and 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 then we'd um discuss at, at the end, you know, what did you what did you feel like? And you but always feeling like we're at this point, what did it feel like? What did it, what did it need? And and then you're you know, the the raga was great because it it has limitations, but there's still a gazillion di- directions you can go within mm-hmm. that those limitations. So I think I was just always listening and feeling and with all the music I do, it starts telling you what it, you know, if you're listening and feeling it, it starts telling you what it, you know, what it needs. And so that was my process the whole time. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. We did a lot of, a lot of, a lot of listening. A lot of listening. Yeah. And that's also the beauty of the Raga. Like, what is it doing to you? What is this? Because that's, uh, as Michael pointed out, it's not designed for performance music. It's it's a it's a practice mm-hmm. for the practitioner to get into a a state and then to share that, um, you know. But at at its base, it's it's because it does something. These tones do something to you at extended right. periods. Another thing we left we didn't do strictly in the traditional way is what time of day you play them. So mm-hmm. we, you know, we weren't able to adhere to that and record and according to those instructions, but I find it beautiful that, that they exist. That also here, this is supportive in the morning, you know, as long as you need it, this becomes supportive at noon. And yeah. so the power of this, yeah, the sonic material was also playing a role and um, so the listening became about yeah okay how long does this need to be is it start working on your body at this point and you know mm-hmm. figuring figuring out the length of tracks and the order of tracks and you know that kind of way yeah and um you know a couple i wanted to say a couple things about the record um one, you know, I was going to ask how you linked up with Seance Center, but also two, Michael, to me, this record feels like it's a way to introduce your music to a totally different audience. Um, because I think, you know, your previous like CDs or records are maybe more in a contemporary classical world, modern classical world. But I know that people in younger folks in this other world of you know electronic music uh whatever you want to call it experimental music uh i think will respond deeply to to your work you know but if either of you want to speak on that you know the that relationship with working with you know a cool label like seance center well i, I can just speak to the seance center connection i i i met brandon like a long time ago mm-hmm. in New York. Um, it was probably because I, I worked for this label, Revenge International, and we had used to have a shop uh, called Command. And I met, I think I met Brandon through Command. That makes sense. And yeah. he was a fan of uh, the CV and Jab album that we released on Shelter Press. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it wrote me at some point like, Hey, if you're ever looking for a label, I really love the TV and jazz stuff. So it just kind of occurred to me that, that this might be the chance to finally work with Sam center. And he, yeah. Brandon loved the album. Yeah. So his, and his partner, Naomi, they, they were just really enthusiastic about it. So it felt like the right move. Yeah. That's yeah and they were the ones that, um forwarded the double lp idea we we were more in the mindset of okay it's a lot of material but maybe uh, you know one lp is enough for yeah. to digest everything you never you know double lps is a lot but it, it i was we were so happy when they when they forwarded that idea because it meant that um 
tracks like Bhagashri, which we weren't, it, it was a lo really long piece. We weren't sure if it was a one LP, if how, where to fit, what else would have to cut. But suddenly the whole, uh, a wider breadth of the music was possible too. Yeah, that Bhagashri was at one point just going to be like a digital bonus tracker or something but i'm i'm really happy well, it's not yeah <laughs> it, 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 i mean like like a lot people really love a lot of people piece. respond to that piece yeah specifically and yeah. i yeah i'm just really happy it got included because yeah. it's you know it's the, the real deal it's the long form it's the closest i mean it's the closest the album gets to like a traditional raga right. length yeah there's something recognizable about it even if you're not a listener of Indian classical because my, my, Michael also told us it's been picked up this, this Bhagashri, you know, like the Beatles and mm -hmm. a lot of artists have gravitated towards that one. So there's yeah. something that works on your memory, like, Oh, this is familiar, but I'm not sure from where. And it's, it's a nice quality, I think. Yeah. Michael, how do you feel about, yeah, like trying to, I mean, obviously you probably love the fact of trying to get your music um, to new and different audiences. And that's kind of the initial connection you guys made because you went to Ambient Church and saw this great scene of younger folks like really getting into this music. And so now it, it's hopefully it's reciprocal and that they'll get into your music. <laughs> It's a dream opportunity, you yeah. know, because I mean, there's nothing that as composers that we want more than a broader audience. You know? Right. And, uh, and Christina and John have, you know, a, a huge audience for what they're doing. And it's a very different audience to what I'm doing. Right. Um, we actually had a conversation about Christina and I did very early on about you know, she was asking something like, well, are there any contemporary classical music composers that do uh, ambient music, you know, or, or, you know, do any ambient composers, you know, win awards like the Guggenheim Fellowship? And um, so I thought about it and I said, you know, there's, it's not, at least at that time, maybe it's happening a little more now, but, um, it was hard to really pin down good examples of Western com classical composers that are doing that. And so I just thought, well, maybe I'm one of those people that's more in that realm. Because mm -hmm. my music, I mean, even like Just Constellations for Room Full of Teeth, I mean, you can see that as an ambient piece. Yeah. The piece for Chris Jensen, uh, Cello Constellations, I mean, she played it at the ambient church. You know, it fit yeah. right in with the, <laughs> the mood of the scene and what people were listening to. People seem to love it. So I, I felt like this was really a perfect opportunity for me to explore something in that in that realm. And and I can tell you that it's just the beginning. That's yeah, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> well I think that's probably a good uh, good place to wrap it up. I Michael, I you know have a lot of questions about like your tuning system and just intonation and all that, but that's probably a whole nother uh, conversation uh, we can get into another time. But um, thanks a lot, you guys for talking to me. I really appreciate it. And again, love the record. Um, here it is. Got it here. Um, it's beautiful. So Turned out beautiful. Great. And I'll be, and we think, we, we should give a we shout, give out, a shout to, Perul. yeah, sorry, uh, Perul Gupta. Perul Gupta artwork from Yeah, Madagascar. the artwork is, is amazing. Yeah. yeah. So I'll be yeah. mailing, you know, the LPs out to subscribers in early October. So you'll have, you'll have a batch of new, new people, new ears listening to it. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you so much, Greg. Yeah. All right. Thanks, listening. guys. Yeah. Thank yeah. You, All right. Really fantastic yeah. your support and all your listeners, you know, just a really great model of what you're doing. Fantastic way to bring the music to. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate it. And uh, it's our it, it's our first interview too. It's nice. It's really nice oh, to nice. discuss. Yeah, what we did there. So thanks.
Yeah, that's something I wanted to do with with this, you know, subscription series is just to have, a, you know, an additional like layer of, you know, context or just something yeah. interesting for people to check out. And um, mm -hmm. it just personally, it gives me a chance to like, have fun and talk to, you know, musicians yeah. and people and um, I love doing it. So it's, it's super fun. Yeah. All right, guys, take care and nice to meet Enjoy you. Your day. Yeah. yeah. And right. keep in touch. Thank Bye -bye. you. Ciao.